Hey, hello. My name is Rafał Pucztarski. I don't know if the audio is okay. I will just adjust the microphone. Uh, my name is Rafał Pucztarski. I uh, I am going to talk about object reoriented programming uh, to go back to the roots of object oriented programming and see uh, how we deviated over the years and uh, what the original uh, creators of the idea have envisioned and what are we doing right now. Okay, so you, some of you might know me from Stack Overflow because I, I have met some people who uh, didn't know me but they recognize my avatar. So uh, that's always nice. So uh, I write mostly about JavaScript and Node.js. So if you uh, follow those topics, then uh, there's some chance that you've seen some of my answers. Okay, that's enough about me. I, uh, I think we will go to the uh, object reoriented programming. That is going back to the fundamentals of object-oriented programming in JavaScript and TypeScript, because uh, in JavaScript and also because of that in TypeScript we have uh, we have some uh, somewhat different problems than in other environments. So I would like to talk about, uh, and also I guess that most of you are familiar with JavaScript and TypeScript, at least with JavaScript. Okay, so I will. Uh, talk a little bit about, about my first contact with object-oriented programming. It it was actually uh, with C++ and I didn't like it and came back to C. And uh, quite frankly, I was 12 years old, so maybe I just didn't get it. But uh, the, the examples that I've seen were just for me, it was like the object were like structs and the methods were like just C functions and with just one uh, implicit parameter and uh, actually most of the most of the examples that I've seen in C++ I could implement in C uh, more efficiently and not even more uh, it, it didn't even took uh, a lot more code so I didn't like it and then I uh, yeah th that I, I I wasn't impressed it's maybe my use case were not uh, it was not very serious software when I was a kid, but uh, I wasn't impressed and just came back to C. Uh, then later I started wa writing in JavaScript and um, I appreciated much simpler object-oriented programming model than what I've seen in C++, but uh, also I discovered functional programming in JavaScript and it just was so much powerful than what I've seen in the examples of object-oriented programming. So, uh, quite frankly, I wrote most of my JavaScript uh, in a very functional way instead of uh, doing the usual object-oriented programming things, uh, except, of course, using the objects that are uh, already there in the environment, in the DOM uh, environment and in the language itself. So, But for me, the methods were just like methods on objects were just like namespaced functions and just pretty much not not very uh, it, it was not very different from the typical procedural programming that I've done before so and also the code seemed very uh, very similar but just like namespaced functions to just a, a little bit less mess but n n not very different conceptually then some years later, I, I've done a lot of Perl and JavaScript. Um, in Perl, the object-oriented program was pretty much similar and even less magical than in JavaScript, but I won't go into that. But then I saw an interesting quote. A quote by, by Alan Kay, who said that, actually, I made up the term object-oriented, and I can tell you I did not have C++ in mind. And that got me thinking, because if I didn't like object-oriented programming uh, because of my first exposure to C++ and someone who invented the term object-oriented programming explicitly said that he didn't have C++ in mind and uh, saying that uh, was of course quite controversial in the, uh, in the C++ programmers uh, community but nevertheless if a creator of uh, object-oriented programming explicitly excluded C++ from, uh, from uh, his vision, then uh, it really got me thinking. So the big question for me was, uh, what did Alan Kay have in mind? So uh, if not C++ uh, that I was exposed 
to first when I learned about object-oriented programming, then what was it? What was the idea of object-oriented programming and w what was it all about? So was it about objects? Uh, everyone asked what is an object. Is uh, th 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 There are a lot of answers, but in some languages, pretty much everything is an object. So if everything is an object, then it's, uh, it's hard to uh, it's hard to see how the object-oriented programming, wh wh what does it mean if everything in a language is an object? In some languages, even classes are objects. In other classes, in other languages, there are no real classes. Like, uh, like in JavaScript, you just have, uh, we just have uh, constructor functions that uh, with some fan fancy new syntax. But is it about objects? Everything is an object. It's so, so it's, it's pretty probably not that. Is it about classes? Not not every object-oriented programming language has classes, and not, not I'm not only talking about JavaScript or, or TypeScript, but for example, Self, uh, one of the first object-oriented programming languages, is pretty much a version of Smalltalk, but with uh, prototypal inheritance, pretty much similar to s what we have in JavaScript right now. So, n classes are not not necessary for uh, a language to be considered object-oriented. So, is it about inheritance? Also, uh, it doesn't seem so because inheritance is, uh, first of all, is very different among different languages, and you don't really need to use inheritance to uh, to, uh, to to work in, the in in most of the languages. Inheritance seems like mostly a way to uh, reuse some code uh, to um, to build some classes more efficiently or some prototypes more efficiently. So the inheritance is not really uh, crucial to using object-oriented programming. So is it method calls? Uh, seems like it, but it's just the way I've seen the examples uh, when I was first exposed to object-oriented programming, the method calls was just like function calls and with just one additional implicit argument. So it wasn't very groundbreaking, so it, it wasn't that different. And actually, I've uh, before that, I've written C code that uh, where I was just passing uh, a struct uh, as a first parameter to functions that it pretty much worked very similarly to methods. So every, uh, every function was working like a method, and the first argument was uh, a struct that w kept the state of the object that it was working on. And uh, the only difference in uh, in classical uh, languages like Java or C++ is like better namespacing and no name conflicts. Okay, so maybe it's something else. Do, do you maybe have some idea what 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 was the most important thing in object-oriented programming? Not necessarily what we do today, but what was the idea behind? Uh, what was the creators uh, envisioned? So. Uh, actually, w when I found out, I uh, it took some time because it's n it's not very uh, obvious to uh, when you see some uh, code examples today. But it's about message passing. And what's the difference between method calls and message passing? Seems like there is not very important difference, but it actually is. And message passing just got implemented as method calls in C++ and Java. So it's it's type of implementation of message passing. So instead of uh, to conceptually you send a message to an object to do something and you implement it in a language that you just call a method on that object that uh, is equivalent to the message that you are uh, passing to that object, plus some arguments that go along with that message. So for example, if uh, uh, well, you, you, you get the idea. It's, it's pretty much the implementation, the type of implementation that the message passing got implemented in C++ and then in Java. Okay, so quite naturally, the message passing got implemented as well as method calls in JavaScript and TypeScript. And it's, uh, at the face of it, it seems like it's not a much of a difference, but actually it is, because why it is a problem? Why it is a problem in a single-threaded environment? And we, uh, y using JavaScript and TypeScript, um, w we have very different computation model than uh, people uh, that are working in C++, in C Sharp, in Java, in uh, C, and pretty much every other language, because, uh, because we don't have threads, and we can't block on any 
um, a computation that does any I.O. or does anything that takes more than just microseconds. Uh, so now, why is it a problem in a single thread environment? And the question is, if you were to design a message passing protocol in JavaScript, would you do it synchronously? And of course, I wouldn't, because uh, every everything that uh, that uh, has anything to do with passing messages in in uh, in JavaScript is done with events, is done with uh, now with, with, with some uh, promises, with callbacks. And I I if you think about the message passing, and not about method calls, as it's just an implementation type for the concept of message passing to objects, then you suddenly think that maybe method calls is not the best way to implement message passing in a single threaded environment like JavaScript or TypeScript when, uh, when if you uh, implement it uh, as method calls that return values synchronously or raise exceptions, then you are very restricted to only the kinds of computation that you can uh, do uh, immediately without blocking the event loop. and. Uh, and quite frankly, this is not the most interesting uh, type of computation that you usually do in a larger system. So, uh, and we forgot about message passing, so we we just don't uh, we just don't think of it as a problem because if we n just think about method calls, and yeah, we have method calls in JavaScript like we do in C plus plus or in uh, any other language, but. If we focus on the message passing that was the original idea, then suddenly we we tend to think that maybe synchronous function calls is not the best way to implement it. And what are the problems that it actually causes? Going back, wh what are the problems of uh, implementing message passing in a synchronous way in a single-threaded language like JavaScript? First of all, con concurrency. So every method call must return something imme immediately or raise an exception. So it cannot do any I.O. Uh, it cannot do any networking. Uh, it, yeah, it cannot do any I.O. and uh, we cannot build really distributed systems because, for example, a method of an object cannot uh, invoke another method that lives on another system over the network because it would block the event loop, so it's just out of the question. Uh, in other languages like Java, we don't have the problem. We just spawn another thread, and uh, uh, or we can, s uh, in some other languages, we can uh, create another process. We can fork a process and just uh, do some computation that is blocking, and th there's not much problem. But in JavaScript, we have non-blocking I/O. Uh, we have uh, to do all the networking um, operations asynchronously. And that means that no method call can really do anything really interesting, like I/O, like uh, connect to a database, like connect to a remote system, like make a REST uh, API call or anything like that. Uh, and also, we can make some methods, and it's usually implemented that way. That, for example, are explicit. The, the API, the public API of some uh, libraries, are explicitly. Um, uh, created in a way that uh, they return promises or they take callbacks or uh, they uh, fire some events, but uh, we cannot refactor uh, anything that is already uh, exposing a public API that is synchronous. Uh, we cannot refactor it, it to, uh, for example, for example, if you have a function that uh, that computes factorial, we, we cannot outsource it to an external system uh, because it would need to uh, make some uh, network call and that would block the entire event loop and for that we would need to do it asynchronously and use some events or callbacks or promises and if the uh, original API is, uh, is synchronous, it's just a function that returns an, uh, a result, then uh, in that case, we cannot uh, refactor it internally to make a use of some external system without breaking the API. So uh, th there is a problem of refactoring if we uh, live in a duality of synchronous and asynchronous operations. And in JavaScript, we have it everywhere. So uh, and actually, it uh, it was even worse than we we have actually many types of asynchronous. Uh, types of operations. So that there are functions that take callbacks, 
uh, there are s some event emitters that uh, emit e events uh, when they get some uh, when they have some data to return uh, there are uh, functions that return promises uh, and um, and so, so we have at least three ways of do asynchronous uh, operations and we of course have one way to make synchronous calls just a function that uh, an ordinary function that returns a value or, or raises an exception so uh, but it's uh, we cannot change the synchronous function to be asynchronous without changing all the code that uses it so uh, it's it's not very convenient for refactoring in that way so what is the solution and the solution would be to go async only for all public APIs. Uh, that, that's because we cannot go sync only. So, um, and if we need consistency, then there's unfortunately not other way to, to do it. So uh, if we want to have every public API uh, look the same for the consumer of the API, of this so like a caller of that function, um, then we cannot do everything uh, look synchronously because like we could do it in java uh, because we could block the event loop so but we indeed can do it uh, in a way that looks asynchronously but it's not very convenient so because of the syntax differences and actually i had five takes on that over the years to uh, think about how to uh, make a consistent uh, consistent style of uh, of using of building um, public apis uh, like apis in a way of uh, function calls or method calls or objects uh, that wouldn't uh, expose the implementation detail of the fact if uh, whether it uh, computes the results synchronously or asynchronously because uh, if we expose it then we cannot really change it uh, at least we cannot change it uh, in one uh, direction. So we uh, uh, we cannot have a, a synchronous function that returns a, a value and then later uh, think that maybe that value we will take from the database. So it just cannot return it. I, it can return a promise, but not a value itself. So it breaks the API, it breaks the contract. So if we have a public library, then every consumer of that library needs to change all of the code that uses it. So uh, it's problematic. So the only other way is to m do everything look asynchronously. And of course, uh, it uh, leads to a lot of problems. So for example, the, my first take on that was to uh, create objects that get messages and emit events. So uh going back to the m original idea of message passing it was it seems natural to implement them as just uh, some api to pass messages and maybe emit events when the messages uh, I I in a similar way that uh, for example if if the if we ask an object for something then uh, it would emit an event if it got it but uh, it was very inconvenient it was completely different code it uh, everything needed to be rewritten and was complex to control the, uh, the control of the, the application. Uh, events inside of events, it it uh, it's, it gets complicated pretty quickly. So it's it's not a very good substitute to just function called return a value. Uh, my second take on that was to use methods only that take callbacks instead of returning value. So if uh, anyone of you is familiar with Node.js, then uh, there are the error first callbacks, uh, the uh, original node style, um, uh, node style of uh, concurrency uh, for asynchronous operations, because unfortunately Ryan Dahl didn't use promises uh, from the beginning. Actually, they went into node and then was, uh, was removed at the beginning, but uh, so we got a different API of functions that instead of returning values, uh, they take an additional parameter that is a callback to be called when the uh, uh, result of the computation is available. And the function by convention uh, takes two arguments. First is the error if there was an error, and the second one is the data if there was no error and there, there was some data. So uh, it's uh, so it's similar to classic Node.js. It's kind of a complex control flow. We we have 
uh, modules, uh, very good libraries to uh, have with that, like the async library on NPM, but uh, using it for every public method of a library, it's, it seems uh, it seems like overkill. It, it, it was uh, quite um, quite to to implement and to use. My third uh, idea was to uh, use methods, uh, and I'm talking about any public method of a, uh, of some library uh, to make all methods return promises instead of values, even if they could return the value immediately. So, for example, even if I have a f library that computes factorial. Uh, it could return, I, I, if it's implemented synchronously and uh, I can return it immediately, uh, the result, then I still uh, return a promise of that result, even if it's just a promise resolve and that value. Not because it uh, it makes a lot of sense, it, uh, it is less performant, but uh, just to um, uh, make sure that I am able to later implement it in other way that maybe requires some database calls or maybe I'm using some uh, distributed systems to compute uh, to, to make the actual computation so it's less convenient to uh, to express that uh, to to use it and to uh, to actually implement it but uh, it gives a freedom that uh, that one detail uh, of whether it is uh, computing the results synchronously or asynchronously is is completely uh, hidden from the user of the uh, of the interface. So th that was my main idea, and it was still closer, but um, uh, still not very convenient to use, especially uh, before some things that were avail that weren't available uh, then. And later, I came to the uh, to, to to using the generator based coroutines to. Uh, it's like um, I don't know if any one of you is uh, familiar, but um the bluebird library has it uh, there was a co library co uh, just to so you um, define generator functions the function star in javascript uh, wrapped in some wrappers that uh, made the generators uh, like j uh, like uh, yield promises that uh, it uh, wanted to wait for when they are resolved. It's it's uh, it, it's a very nice idea, and what uh, it was better than pure promises, but it, it it was a lot of wrappers and a lot of uh, boilerplate. And actually, uh, the generator-based coroutines um, was some of the basis of the idea of async await that we have today in JavaScript and TypeScript. So. Uh, and now it's quite convenient because uh, we don't have the boilerplate of generator functions and their wrappers. Uh, we don't need to use callbacks. Uh, we don't. Um, w we don't need to use some complicated li libraries to uh, handle the control flow of more complicated uh, applications. And what's the maybe the most interesting is that. Uh, Error handling in the async functions is for the first time is exactly the same as for the func uh, functions that are synchronous. So, uh, if you uh, await on a promise, then it either returns a value when that promise is resolved, or it raises an excep exception when that promise is rejected, and it doesn't block uh, the event loop. Uh, it just uh, actually it's implemented similar to the uh, to the Mm, coroutines based on uh, generators, uh, but maybe we'll not go into uh, that very far. But if any one of you is uh, is familiar, then it's a, it's a very nice syntax because functions that are uh, synchronous and asynchronous uh, don't need two different types of error handling like we had before. So, for example, if we had a function that uh, took some uh, callback, then it might um, raise an exception uh, or throw throw an error. Uh, in other words, uh, if, for example, I passed uh, some bad arguments, so I needed to try catch blocks around it. But also, the callback needed to um, needed to be prepared for a situation where uh, there is an error that is. Uh, um, that happened asynchronously later, so I need to check 
the error in the callback if I forget it then I might some get some you know um, undefined is not a functions and things like that very useful errors um, and um, so, so basically I needed uh, always needed to uh, whether I used um, w whether I use uh, just event emitters I need uh, synchronous I need to handle synchronous errors by try catch blocks and in the events I usually handle the error event uh, if I use callbacks uh, for example the er node style error first callbacks then I need to uh, in many cases uh, handle synchronous errors of for example bad arguments to the function by a try catch block to uh, to catch the synchronous exceptions and also uh, handle the error in the callback and also if I use traditional uh, promise um, promise API of then and catch um, methods then still I could have a function that return a promise but maybe that function throws uh, 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 throws um, an exception when, for example, it has bad arguments. Then I need to put it in a try catch block. But the promise itself could be rejected, so I need to also handle that as well. So I, I always lived uh, up till now in in a duality of especially error handling. So if you don't do error handling, then it may seem not very uh, complicated. But if you do, then trust me, it's, it, it it gets it, it gets messy. So um, especially if you do a lot of I/O and uh, mix a lot of synchronous and asynchronous um, uh, computation. So, and the f so the, fi uh, the number five of uh, of those uh, searches of uh, a good API to uh, to merge the synchronous and asynchronous dichotomy in JavaScript was as finally the async await uh, syntax in JavaScript. So. And also before async uh, was around, I created a library on npm just to uh, it, uh, it actually uh, uh, at the end I will give you the link to the um, to the slides so you don't need to write it down if uh, if you want to uh, at, at the end there will be a link to all the slides and there will be a links but uh, I only will say that the general idea of the uh, library and actually uh, also. Uh, my uh, GitHub and uh, Stack Overflow handle is RSP from my initials. But actually, the name of the package is coincidence. So, uh, it, it actually was searching some ideas, and the first one was really simple promises and radically simplified promises. And uh, and actually, the first name was RSP promise. But then I started to use in in uh, when I required it to make it simpler. I I just use you know var rsp equals require rs promise, and I saw that, that that's my my handle. So why not use it as the name of the library? So the library is what the library does is it takes a promise um, and returns another promise, but a little bit magic in a way that if for example it's a promise that might resolve a string. Then uh, this RSP uh, promise is a promise that also eventually resolves to a string, but also you can directly call methods on it that you can uh, uh, call on any string. And those will be called on the string in the future when the promise is resolved. And what you get is, uh, is still a promise of the value that would be eventually returned by those methods as soon as it is quite complicated it's easier to see the example so i won't go into that it's actually quite simple so we can if you have a promise of a string you can uh, for example uh, run a uh, two uppercase method on it and you just get a promise of a uppercase string as soon as the original string is uh, the, the promise of the original string is resolved so uh, but it's just uh, uh, just just to show you that it's it's quite a long way to to um, to manage the and actually I don't think it's useful now as w uh, when we have async await so uh, it was to uh, simplify um, the asynchronous calls when you have them everywhere so but it's just uh, uh, it's and, and but what I uh, what I discovered back then is that it was very easy to do for methods. So I, I used um, proxy objects in JavaScript. And actually, it, I, I need to upgrade the library because it still uses some, um, uh, some, um, some libraries to 
uh, mock the proxy objects if it's not available. It was not available in Node.js back then and uh, only with some Harmony proxy switches and uh, it's quite old, but uh, but I used proxy objects that uh, returned for, for every unknown uh, property of an object. It returned a function uh, that acted like the method but uh, returned a promise of a result that that method of the same name would be called on the object that the uh, promise resolved to and it's maybe I will uh, <laughs> not go any farther with that but it's uh, so it was easy to call methods in the future of promises of objects that are in uh, that, that we are waiting of in the promises but it was really complicated for getting aesthetic properties so I would easily call methods on objects that were uh, that I was w uh, waiting for but I couldn't find a good syntax to uh, get and set properties so I had a lot of uh, frustration with that and I, I used some uh, strange syntax I, I don't know if audio is still on because I okay uh, so um, but the question is is object oriented programming about getting and setting properties if it's not then maybe it's not that important and it's a quote that uh, I um, I encourage you to search for in the lectures that I linked later in the uh, in the uh, in my presentation so it's really worth watching and maybe you'll find who said it that object is not a data structure and assignment cannot be done from the outside so it's it's right right away it throws uh, throws all the you know just object that property equals something or even just reading and properties uh, it, th this uh, statement is just completely um, a completely discouraging such a behavior and also uh, even getters and setters are not much different so and uh, actually if you look at it then y y you can see that a lot of people are uh, writing in statically typed languages when they have properties that are private and then they expose them uh, with getters and setters so it's not much different just the syntax is less convenient so uh, but still the internal state of the object is exposed and I it's the question is, is that a good object-oriented programming? So I, I, I'd like to f show you a few books that changed completely my way of thinking. Just quickly, um, I encourage you to read them. And the first one is The Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programs by uh, Hal Abelson and Jerry Sussman. And uh, it's, it's, I think it's the most important book in, s in computer science, actually. And not only the book, but I would uh, advise you to start from the lectures the f of the same name from MIT. There's the recording from 1996 uh, lectures of MIT. Then I really uh, think that uh, everyone should read it. So uh, the second book uh, that relates to this very topic is Object Thinking, but by David West, and it's eye-opening. Uh, and it's uh, I won't go very far. Just 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 get it and read it. So you you will start thinking completely differently o uh, about object-oriented programming, what it's all about. Um, also, uh, it's worth watching uh, the interviews with David West and some, some of his lectures. And um, one of the books that is also um, helped me uh, uh, look very differently on the object model in JavaScript is Programming JavaScript Applications by Eric Elliott, uh, when I where he proposes an interesting uh, library to um, to stop using even prototypal inheritance, not even uh, to say about the class uh, syntax in uh, in in ECMAScript six, but just to uh, just to create um, factory functions that are composable. So I it's a completely different uh, different syntax, com completely different behavior. Uh, but it shows I it's an interesting uh, idea to see that you can implement object-oriented programming completely differently than what you already have in a language and even using the language you can uh, y you can focus on some other types of composition not of inheritance but um, of other ways of composing um, behaviors together of objects and uh, the last books that I would recommend uh, that are relevant uh, here and that inspired me to 
uh, once again change my way of thinking about what I'm talking right now is Elegant Objects by Yegor Bugayenko. Uh, there are two parts of that and uh, both are worth reading. The first one is more general, in uh, more theoretical, and the second one uh, shows very interesting uh, code examples and very practical advices. It's, it focuses mostly on Java, but uh, some th there are some Ruby examples, uh, but, uh, but it's, uh, it's a pra practical application of what David West uh, was, um, was, uh, was writing about in his object thinking. And uh, actually, Yegor Bugayenko uh, made very interesting um, interviews with uh, David West, so I also recommend watching them. So th those books uh, w changed my way on thinking about object-oriented programming, every one of them, and uh, it's like uh, every time I, I want to just uh, look to the roots of the idea, uh, it's, it's very important to, for example, first of all, uh, just to um uh just to um go to the people who created it there are some lectures around of, of alan k of david west uh, so th there are great lectures of by alan k from from the 80s and uh y y you really ne if you want to do object oriented programming uh, then uh, you just have to to watch him watch it because uh Otherwise, we are just doing procedural programming, just using method calls instead of uh, instead of procedu pr procedures. And um, and for example, myself, I was just writing the same code as I was writing in C, but later I I was using some uh, nominally object-oriented programming languages, but I was just writing the same kind of code. It was just uh, just procedural. And uh, but uh, object-oriented programming is something more than just namespacing of the functions to make it more convenient and just some method dispatch and some inheritance to reuse code. It's it's completely different way of thinking. Just like functional programming is is completely different, and you just cannot uh, understand functional programming if you don't know, for example, the lambda calculus and the mathematical foundations of that. Uh, just like you cannot really understand relational databases if you don't know relational algebra. And, um, and if you do, then you uh, look completely differently on relational databases, just like you look completely differently on functional programming as soon as you learn uh, Lambda Calculus, or I always recommend those MIT lectures that I was, uh, the structure and the interpretation of computer programs. So, but the practical, uh, uh, implication of reading, especially Yegor Bugayenko's book, is that there are many interesting rules, uh, very strict rules to follow, to uh, to be strictly object-oriented as he understands it, based uh, on his interviews with David West and based on other um, um, founding ideas. And it was actually quite interesting for my use case, because for example, one of the rules is that no objects should, should have any public properties. So, uh, so if I uh, don't have public properties, then I need, don't need to uh, don't need to um, care about them. So it solves a lot of my problems. So, to sum it up, those three uh, kinds of ideas from the books are what makes object-oriented programming in my idea, and it's worth looking. Uh, you will see m uh, one of my um, uh, uh, the URL of my slides at the end. Uh, I'm uh, getting a signs that I need to uh, to to, to uh, finish the presentation already, right? So uh, I will go quickly about what I have now. My plans are to uh, what I call avant-garde objects to uh, think about some uh, specification of object-oriented programming in JavaScript and TypeScript based on the asynchronous ideas that I had before, uh, combined with uh, w some of the rules by Yegor Bugayenko and David West and uh, some rules of object-oriented programming. I'm also, w uh, and I want to create a test assertion library to uh, test those ideas that would strictly uh, adhere to that. So I, th there are some recommended talks and lectures. Uh, you will have them in the in the slides. Uh, s the slides are available on the URL that you see above, so you can see them. And um, at the end, uh, I would like to write a quote of Alan Kay that uh, 
uh, from one of the lectures that I linked here, um, that in the original object-oriented systems that, uh, they when that were so successful, messages aren't comments at all. What they are, are desires. And think about it, read the, uh, read the books that I recommend, watch the lectures, I think about what Alan Kay have envisioned what uh, the first founders of object-oriented programming were doing, and if you have some questions then let me know. Thank you. Great applause. <laughs> first question. Do you have any timelines uh, as uh, where you're looking to complete uh, um, uh, the avant-garde objects uh, or even start at least? Uh, yes, I, uh, my timeline is as soon as I can. So it's, it's one of my, uh, on the top of my head, but I have so much work right now. So, but if you follow me on Twitter, for example, then I will sh surely tweet about it. So th there are links to social media on my website. So uh, I'd be happy to share uh, the progress of uh, what, I, what I have in mind right now. One more. Uh, maybe you're looking for uh, for some help, by the way. <laughs> yeah, of course. So I'll get in touch then. Okay, sure. Applause for that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, any any more questions? Okay, I don't know if you heard, uh, if you thought about this, that actually you can put the response. Does it work? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so I don't know if you thought about this, that actually the uh, color, on the color side, you have the uh, possibility to make an, to make sure that the um, pr uh, Kali returned the promise, like you, you mentioned await async, like await, um, you can await on synchronous value, right? And it yes. will make sure that it's, that it will normalize the return value, right? And this is something that, you know, gives the flexibility of implementing the, the, the Kali, like y it doesn't have to be really asynchronous, right? Because on the color side, you can make sure that it's treated in the, uh, you know, uniform way. So, you know, just to Yes, yes, that's true. And uh, the problem with that is that if the Kali is, uh, uh, is exposing its implementation detail, uh, whether it is synchronous or not, uh, then some of the callers will inevitably just, you know, uh, use the value as it is, no, not await on it. But uh, in the current syntax, all you have to do is just put an as uh, async uh, keyword before the function keyword and y y y it just returns a promise so uh, f so uh, uh, th th uh, there is no problem of that and also uh, that way uh, if you if you async then it's not a problem but if you just try to uh, for example uh, call a then method on something that is not a promise then and you never know what uh, w w what the caller will be uh, using it so for example if uh, how the M maybe it uses some framework to uh, to await on it all to just resolve multiple promises uh, like promise all but from some library that works differently so uh, uh, so yes but 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 you're right you, you can await on a, a s uh, not promised value and it will just behave like a promise any other questions i think it's it's uh Excellent. We can uh, we can finish on this and uh, thank you very much Rafa for your presentation.